Chapter Five of King and Parliament by George Henry Wakeling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Civil War to the King's Death, sixteen forty two to sixteen forty nine. When war was thus declared, neither party had a powerful army, a definite plan of action, or a sure hold on any large tract of the country but roughly speaking it may be said that the north and west favoured the king while the east and south immeasurably the richer half of england adhered to parliament yet there were local struggles in which divisions appeared inside these limits and along the border line between east and west in yorkshire staffordshire leicestershire warwickshire berkshire and hampshire there was plentiful division the king could reckon on the strong loyalty which was still felt for his person and for the cause of the church among large numbers of the nobility gentry and peasantry parliament was sure of a few similar adherents and of the whole of the middle classes in the districts which held to them but there was this important difference the royal cause centred round a person the parliamentary cause round a principle little understood and vaguely enunciated further in the parliamentary cause there was this difficulty what was the real aim of the war was charles to be beaten in the field and forced to terms or pursued and punished this is what made the rebel position so awkward there was no clear understanding of the object of the war the vow to live and die in defence of king and parliament did not sound a very thrilling cry when those who uttered it were fighting with one but against the other the king on the other hand had a clear end to pursue the conquest and subjection of parliament for which he needed only a victorious march to london thus the struggle was sure to develop in one direction the king must attack and the rebels must defend the line which divided their respective strongholds every accession of territory for the king would be therefore a step nearer his end but for parliament attention must be concentrated on defence even if they beat him charles was still king and no one knew on what terms parliament would lay down their arms this course of action defence by parliament and attack by charles was made even more necessary by the fact that the former had no reliable permanent force too many of the parliament's adherents were willing to fight a campaign with the clear object of barring the king's progress to london or relieving a besieged garrison but they were sure to flag when the effort was over the londoners as is their miskent custom after a piece of service get them home says the scots commissioner meanwhile the war had definitely commenced with some advantage to the parliamentarians goring who held portsmouth for the king surrendered it early in september and thus put an end for the present to any hope of a strong southern position for the royalists the marquis of hartford had been placed by charles in command of his forces in the southwest but was stoutly resisted he succeeded in getting possession of shepton mallet but was besieged on taking post at sherborne and failed to make any stand in these parts he went therefore into wales sending his lieutenant sir ralph hopton to cornwall the central struggle of the year was between the king and the main parliamentary army under essex the latter assembled at northampton and pressed on towards nottingham where charles had but a small force the king determined to march westward and recruit his ranks among his adherents in wales on his way from shrewsbury to chester he gained large reinforcements essex followed and occupied worcester though prince rupert the king's nephew a dashing reckless cavalry officer won a skirmish at powick bridge in an endeavour to save it having at last gathered a host of some strength charles started for london on october twelfth essex followed and came up with him on the slopes of edgehill not far from banbury the royal forces had to leave a strong position on edgehill to make the attack rupert at once charged drove the enemy's cavalry before him and pursued them for five miles 
leaving the king to fight with infantry only. These were practically without leadership, for the king possessed courage without military skill. The Puritan foot soldiers in Essex's army behaved splendidly, and their conduct was matched by that of the king's red regiment. Sir Edmund Verney died with the royal standard in his hands, and the Earl of Lindsay, the king's general-in-chief, was taken prisoner, mortally wounded. When evening came, the royalist position was still maintained, though Rupert returned to the field to find that his reckless pursuit had turned a victory into a drawn battle. Charles had so far the best of the encounter that he was able to go to Oxford after taking Banbury. There had been some conflict in Oxford where the loyalty of the university was not shared by the townsmen, but now it was to become the king's chief stronghold and headquarters during the rest of the war. The way to London was open, and the advance began in November. The citizens expected an attack. When Rupert had sacked Brentford, the whole militia of London marched out to Turnham Green to oppose the royal army. Charles, not inclined to risk a battle with 25,000 citizens, fighting to save their hearths and homes, retired to Reading and finally to Oxford, thus throwing away his hopes of success. There were now three chief gatherings of royalist forces, the king's headquarters at Oxford, Hopton, small force in Cornwall, and the northern royalists under Newcastle, fighting for supremacy in Yorkshire. These three centres must be separately watched during the next campaigns. In the centre there were many small encounters, chiefly owing to the endeavours of the rebel commanders to stop communication between various royal forces. Essex took Reading and established himself on the east side of Oxford, where he was attacked by Rupert and his cavalry. The engagement at Chalgrove Field, June 1643, is chiefly noteworthy owing to the death of Hampton, the hero of the old dispute about the ship money, who was mortally wounded during the skirmish. The Queen landed on the Yorkshire coast with arms and money from Holland, and the royalist successes in the Midlands, where they took Tamworth, Lichfield, and many other towns, enabled her to get safely from York to Oxford. In the north, Newcastle had some difficulty in holding his own against Lord Fairfax and his son Thomas, Yorkshire magnates who were vigorous for Parliament. He penetrated as far as Pontefract after beating Lord Fairfax at Tadcaster. As Newark was held for the king, it would have been easy for him now to join Charles, but he preferred to turn his attention to the reduction of the West Riding. His advance was checked by the younger Fairfax, who recovered a part of the county for Parliament. This was, however, retrieved by a victory over the two Fairfaxes at Edwalton Moor, June 30th, 1643, which once more turned the tide in the north. Hull alone held out for Parliament. To utilize this success by an attack on the enemy's forces in the eastern counties was Newcastle's next project. This, however, was not well carried out, and the eastern roundheads under Colonel Oliver Cromwell, who now first appears on the scene, were able to beat the royalists at Gainsborough. Cromwell came of an old Huntingdonshire family and had been in Parliament as early as 1628. He was already giving proofs of those qualities which were to raise him to the foremost place in England. While others hesitated, Cromwell always acted, and knew how to adapt means to ends. While so many in Parliament and in the fields were far from sure as to their aims and methods, this man of clear views and quick action was a power indeed. To common sense and tact, he added all that was most vigorous in Puritanism, a firm belief in divine guidance, and a keen sense that a great cause was entrusted to him and his lovely company, as he called his grim Puritan troopers. Meanwhile, in the west of England, the king's troops had won a series of brilliant victories. Hopton, assisted by the local gentry, among whom the Grenvilles were conspicuous, made himself master of Cornwall. He won a clear victory at Braddock Down in January, and was then confronted by Lord Stamford, who came from Wales to aid the western roundheads. 
the departure of stamford to the west had set hertford free to join charles at oxford with his welsh recruits and when he had taken cirencester all the severn valley except gloucester was in royalist hands sir william waller was now sent as parliamentary general to the west and by his nimble marches secured bristol monmouth and chepstow and surprised hereford meanwhile charles was writing to hopton in cornwall bidding him push on to oxford hopton had again beaten stamford at stratton and taken in most of devonshire this had to be stopped and waller came from wales for the purpose it was no light task for there were already royalist troops at salisbury ready to join hopton their junction was effected at chard and in two combined attacks on waller at lansdowne and roundway down they were completely successful the result of these successes was the surrender of bristol then and for long after the second city in the kingdom thus in these six months of sixteen forty three there had been an almost uninterrupted series of royalist victories with newcastle supreme in yorkshire and hopton in the west charles had no force to fear this was the moment for striking a final blow on his enemies by concentrating all his forces on london but it was impossible hopton and newcastle reported that their troops utterly refused to leave their homes exposed to attacks from rebel garrisons charles himself had a miserable army for such an attempt and the chance was abandoned when it was decided to attempt the siege of gloucester instead of taking advantage of the dissensions in london there had indeed been during this period a growing desire for peace the extreme puritan party had no part in it but the lords in the city of london together with several counties were anxious to send terms to the king the commons had to assent and proposals hardly less stringent than the nineteen propositions were sent to oxford in february of sixteen forty three charles sent counter-proposals demanding restoration of ships forts and revenue protection for the prayer book and a disclaimer of the right to tax and imprison there was no hope of agreement though the fruitless negotiations dragged on for months the determination of the king to besiege gloucester called forth an enthusiasm on the part of his enemies to relieve it essex's resolute eight days march with eight thousand londoners through a hostile country was one of the boldest strokes of the whole war on his approach charles abandoned the siege intending to cut off the enemy's return to london after an unsuccessful attempt to outmanoeuvre essex the royalist force followed him in the direction of newbury the parliamentarians had taken the kennet valley road to london and to occupy newbury was the only chance of barring their passage essex and his men fought their way on from field to field only to find the open country stoutly held two regiments of london trained bands resisted the shock of rupert's cavalry and behaved to wonder the royalists lost some of their noblest lord falkland sickened by the sights and sounds of civil war courted and found death a whole day's fighting left the royal position still unforced but during the night the king being short of ammunition abandoned his posts and essex reached reading in safety the year's fighting was brought to a close by the successes of hopton who led his western army as far as arundel winchester having been already surprised and dartmouth surrendered to rupert's brother morris in the eastern counties lord manchester had been placed in command by the parliament and his second in command cromwell had grasped the truth that enthusiasm equal to that of the cavalier gentlemen could only be secured by enrolling puritans who would fight with a spirit his new levies soon proved their worth by defeating the royalist cavalry at winsby october sixteen forty three with the commencement of sixteen forty four two important changes must be noticed the scots had been induced to send a force into england on the parliamentary side and charles had made a treaty with the irish leaders by which he had already obtained an increased force and hoped for more the solemn league and covenant entered into by the scots and the parliament in september sixteen forty three was from the scottish point of view an alliance for the establishment of presbyterianism in england 
but the English looked little further than the assistance they were likely to afford in the war. The Irish cessation of September 1643 was a twelve months' truce with the Catholics in Ireland, which would enable Charles to bring over his English troops, the wrecks of Strafford's old army, and use them against Parliament. The Solemn League and Covenant was Pym's last triumph. His death in December 1643 removed the great leader who had kept a majority together during the critical days of religious difference in the long parliament and who though no theologian had placed the puritan programme in the van of the parliamentary position he believed in puritanism as a national force but the westminster assembly where a settlement of religion was now being debated was beginning to show a line of division between presbyterians and independents which was, later on, to wreck the cause of Puritanism in England. Difficulties were occurring, too, in the Royalist camp. There were quarrels among the commanders, many of whom, like Prince Rupert and his brother Morris, objected to civilian influence exercised by such men as Hyde and Culpepper. Charles had gathered a counter-parliament in Oxford, his mongrel parliament, as he called it, which also caused trouble, as his conduct in Irish affairs was not popular among the English gentry. But it gave the king's cause a great show of legality, as it included more than half the House of Lords and a third of the Commons. Similar contentions were arising in the eastern counties and among the parliamentary commanders. Essex and Waller were jealous of each other, and Cromwell was anxious to bring forward in the army the independent Puritan elements which he had seen to be of such splendid fighting quality. Thus, with Irish intrigues, military dissensions, and religious bitterness, the intervention of the Scots, who were anxious to convert England to the opinions they held on Presbyterianism, only threw one more question on the table, the divine right of presbyters and elders to rule church and control state. Early in 1644, Hopton's successes received a rude check by his defeat at Cheriton in Hampshire. Newark was also in danger, and there were indications that Newcastle could be hemmed in by the Scots from the north and by Cromwell from the east. The loss of the north would be a crushing blow to Charles, who was unable to concentrate his forces to relieve Newcastle, as he was now met by a combination of Essex and Waller. They approached Oxford at the end of May. Rupert was sent with the best of the king's troops to relieve York, into which Newcastle had retired, and Charles remained in the Midlands with the rest of his host to deal with his two foes. Fortunately for the royal cause, Essex and Waller elected to act separately, and the former went south to relieve the few seaports which held out in Devon and Dorset from local assailants. Charles had now to fight Waller and succeeded in checking him at the engagement of Cropperty Bridge. Waller's troops were clamoring to get home, and thus Charles had no difficulty in marching after Essex, who actually retired into Cornwall in the end of July, and allowed himself to be hemmed in by the king. His army surrendered at Lostwithio, but he himself escaped by sea to Plymouth, September 1644. Meanwhile, this success of the king in the west was more than balanced by the entire loss of the north. Here the Scots had joined the Fairfaxes and the troops of the Eastern Association under Manchester and Cromwell for the siege of York. Rupert had carried all before him till he outmaneuvered the parliamentary generals and reached York. Joining Newcastle's forces, he advanced close to the enemy on the slopes of Marston Moor, on the evening of July 2nd. The rebel forces at once attacked. Cromwell's cuirassiers and Leslie's dragoons broke up Rupert's cavalry, though Goring routed Fairfax on the other wing, and the Scots in the centre were terribly pressed. But Cromwell defeated Goring as he returned from the pursuit, and Leslie succoured his countrymen in the centre. Finally the Royalist infantry fell back, and a complete victory for the rebels dealt a final blow to the king's hopes in the north. But in this perplexing war, local struggles were raging everywhere. There was no unanimity even in Scotland. The Marquis of Montrose, who was opposed to the idea of Presbyterian democracy, placed his hopes in Charles, 
and with the astounding belief that Presbyterianism on an aristocratic basis could be achieved for England and Scotland by helping the Royalist cause, he now raised a Highland force and prepared to strike a blow for the king. He won some wonderful victories beginning with Tippermuir in September 1644, and by the middle of 1645 his successes seemed as if they might have a serious effect on the ultimate event of the war. After the great victory of Marston Moor, there is no doubt that vigorous action on the part of Parliament might have gone far to stop hostilities and bring the king to terms. Charles had to get back from the west, and if the rebel forces could have concentrated rapidly enough, it would have been possible to bar his passage to Oxford and pen him in the western peninsula. The army of Essex was dissolved, but Waller was sent to hold Charles in check and Manchester was ordered to go to the west to support him. Manchester, who is described as a sweet, meek man by the Scotchman Bailey, had no taste for crushing the king in person, while Cromwell, his lieutenant, the darling of the sectaries, felt that this was precisely what was wanted. His troopers, who fined each other for swearing and sang their psalms before throwing themselves on the royalist cavalry, would have followed him against any foe spiritual or political the result was that in spite of the necessity and the eagerness of some manchester asked for a definition of the word west and delayed to cooperate with waller this was fatal charles having given his foes time by waiting for levies arrived near newbury on october twenty second sixteen forty four waller had fallen back and been tardily joined by manchester and cromwell the parliamentary cause was not advanced by the action of the committee of both kingdoms a body in whose hands military matters had been placed since the arrival of the scots in england they gave orders from london and instead of placing one man in command and giving him a general's freedom of action they had on this occasion appointed a council of war to manage the campaign the result was shown in the battle that ensued at newbury the royal forces were strongly posted and it was decided to attack them in the rear by a flank movement. To make success certain, the main body was to divert attention by attacking the royal position in front. A party under Cromwell and others successfully stormed the rear of the king's position at Speen, but Manchester hesitated to make the attack in front, and when he finally did so, late in the day, he was repulsed. Darkness put an end to the struggle, and Charles's forces got safely away toward Oxford the prey had escaped both sides had now lost a great opportunity and both had learnt the lesson organized forces and determined leaders must be obtained for the parliament if they were to beat the king the royal forces must leave oxford to itself and crush their foes in detail as they could not yet get to london meanwhile the parliament had begun to organize the new model army a permanent puritan force which was ready early in 1645. The self-denying ordinance excluded all members of lords and commons from command and left military power in the hands of approved soldier, the younger Fairfax. Hand in hand with this reform came the execution of Archbishop Laud, June 10, 1645, and the further severance of Presbyterians from independence. The latter wished for toleration and state supremacy over the church, the former for the systematic enforcement of Presbyterian methods and no state interference. The independents believed in themselves, while the Presbyterians believed in a system of church government. There was a weighty third party at whose head was the great lawyer Selden, which dissented from the extreme views of both independents and Presbyterians, and meant to uphold state control over both yet the growth of the independent party was on the whole steady the scots were keenly averse to this new form of puritanism and began to hope for something from charles hence the fruitless negotiations which took place at uxbridge in january sixteen forty five the independents smiled and went on with the new model in the spring of sixteen forty five rupert went to wales to recruit and hoped to be joined by charles the two would attack the Scots who had been obliged to send large forces to the north, where Montrose was wasting Argyleshire. 
Cromwell, with a handful of cavalry, made a dashing raid round Oxford and carried off the horses, without which no guns could leave the royal headquarters. By this time the new model was ready, and though Rupert had joined the king, Fairfax was ordered to relieve Taunton. This was a mistake, for it left Charles free to fight the Scots. While he was endeavouring to find them, Fairfax, abandoning the relief of Taunton, came back to besiege Oxford. If the place had been stronger, the king might have beaten the Scots and joined Montrose, who was carrying all before him. But Charles, after sacking Leicester, May 31st, feared to go too far from his southern stronghold, and Fairfax was therefore able to bring him to battle. Charles was at Daventry, and the Royalists neither knew nor cared anything about the new model army. The despised parliamentary forces surprised the king near the village of Naseby on June 14th. Again Rupert dashed off the field after making a brilliant charge. Cromwell and his troopers were thus enabled to turn the scale in favour of the parliamentary infantry, and the king's army was completely beaten and its infantry cut to pieces. Charles's cause was now almost hopeless. Enthusiasm and organisation were on the side of his enemies. Their quarrels were set aside, and the real victory rested with the independents. The royal intrigues with the Irish and with foreign powers had been discovered by the capture of the king's cabinet at Naseby, and proofs of his machinations were on view in London to convince doubters. His commanders were quarrelling, or like Goring, drinking away his cause in the West. The real weakness of the king's position was that he was safe nowhere. His foes now realized that he must be closely followed and prevented from raising another army. He was in Wales in July, but the Scots were making it untenable, and the king's hope was in a junction with his western forces. In the west, however, the new model, after its victory in the Midlands, was engaged in a brilliant campaign which made Parliament masters of the Devonian Peninsula. After Fairfax's victories at Langport and Bridgewater in July, the only ray of hope was in the north. Montrose had beaten the forces sent against him in two brilliant actions at Aldairn and Alford. But his Highlanders, like the troops of Essex and Waller, after a success, got them home to stow their booty. Still, if Montrose could not come south, Charles might join him in the north. With this object the king assembled the Yorkshire gentry at Doncaster, only to find himself hotly pursued by Colonel Points and the Scottish cavalry under David Leslie, though the latter was soon recalled to Scotland to face Montrose, who had just defeated Bailey at Kilsyth. Any hope of getting to Scotland was spoiled by the wariness of Points, and the king was again obliged to make for Oxford. His marches during these months are well described by Clarendon as perpetual motion. Leaving Oxford on August 30th, he managed to relieve Hereford from the Scots, but his recruiting ground was now worked out, and no forces were available for the relief of Bristol, which Fairfax was now besieging. Again the fugitive king wandered aimlessly northwards, only to see his troops defeated by his pursuer near Chester on Roughton Heath, September 24th. From Newark he might still reach Montrose, but that brilliant adventurer had just been beaten and ruined after a year of unprecedented victory by David Leslie at the surprise of Philippow. Bristol was stormed and surrendered on September 10th by Rupert, who had no liking for a failing cause. When Charles, beaten and low-spirited, once more reached Oxford in October, his position in the Midlands had become untenable, owing to the activity of the parliamentary generals. The next few months were occupied by Cromwell and Fairfax in the complete subjugation of the West. Hopton made a gallant stand, but all was lost early in 1646. Chester had surrendered, Newark was invested by the Scots, and South Wales was all but lost. Such hope as the king now had rested on a treaty with the Scots' army. This was possible owing to the disgust of the northerners at the failure of their hopes for the conversion of England to Presbyterianism, and at the complete success of the independence in the army of Cromwell and Fairfax. French diplomacy was used to create a superficial agreement between Charles and the Scots, consisting of a verbal treaty in which neither party said what they meant. The result was that the king left Oxford in May of 1646 
to take refuge in the Scots camp outside Newark. With the capitulation of Oxford on June 24th, the civil war was ended. The Scottish forces retired to Newcastle with the king practically a prisoner in their camp. His position was the result of a resolve to try and get the help of their swords without giving them what they required in return, namely, a definite pledge for Presbyterianism in England. They never intended to take less, and he never meant to grant as much. In fact, the situation had now changed. Intrigue took the place of war. There were three clear parties. First, the Scots, anxious to make England Presbyterian. Secondly, the army of the Parliament, flushed with victory, and hating the Scots as much as the Scots hated bishops. Lastly, the English Parliament itself, where there were many moderate men in favour of a compromise, and as yet a decided majority for Presbyterianism. Charles's object for the next few years was to play with these three forces, in order to secure his own ends, while each party was willing to treat with him also for its own ends. This explains the constant attempts of the various parties to secure the king's person and so gain his ear. The Scots, who held the prize, now combined with Parliament to offer the so-called Newcastle Propositions. The Parliament was perfectly aware of the Scots' intrigue, in spite of their audacious denial of all knowledge of the king's intended journey to their camp. Yet fearing the independence, the majority at Westminster concurred in pressing the treaty by which Charles was asked to take the covenant, abolish episcopacy, and resign the control of militia to Parliament for twenty years. The king's attitude was disappointing. Instead of refusing manfully, he spoke of discussion. The queen, wiser in her generation, wished him to yield, with the hope of getting back his power gradually. Finally, he suggested a compromise which was refused, and the Scots decided to leave England. Their arrears were paid by Parliament, and the king was handed over to English commissioners who took him to Holmby House in Northamptonshire, February 1647. He at once renewed his negotiations with the English Presbyterians, who were more moderate than the Scots. Their main wish was to get rid of the army, and they were now proposing to send some regiments to Ireland and disband others. This led to a most important movement, for the army had long been growing into a political force, and at once organized itself to resist extinction at the hands of a Presbyterian parliament. Each troop elected a representative, and these chose two agitators for each regiment. The army was disgusted at the discovery that Parliament was not only scheming to dissolve it, but also concocting an arrangement with the King in the Presbyterian interest. And so Cromwell and the officers, who had not yet sided with the army against Parliament, contrived to arrange the seizure of Charles by Cornet Joyce. He was taken to Newmarket, and there kept up the feud between his enemies by complaining to Parliament of his unlawful seizure by the army. The two forces, military and civil were now at open strife. The commons were known to be relying on the London-trained bands, and the army promptly issued its famous manifesto, in which the leaders declared they would march on the city to satisfy their just demands. The trained bands were called out, but the army shrank from bloodshed, and the manifesto on being handed to Parliament was found to contain a demand for a dissolution and short parliaments, in which we can trace the idea of sovereignty of the people. Another peremptory request was for the expulsion of eleven Presbyterian members who had been instrumental in the late negotiations with the king. These prudently fled, but the commons resolved that the army should not come within twenty-five miles of London. The flight of the leading Presbyterians made Parliament more inclined to come to terms with the army, but the city was still in favour of accepting a compromise with Charles, and many of the independent members took refuge from mob violence in the army. This gave Fairfax an excuse for marching on London, which he did in August 1647, to restore these members. Meanwhile, Cromwell and Fairfax had themselves been endeavouring to come to some terms with the king. 
but the extreme democratic party in the army led by the agitators was for a more complete change including manhood suffrage and avowed popular sovereignty thus the king had a threefold choice to side with the moderate presbyterians to accept the moderate army proposals or to succumb to the thorough-paced democracy of the levelling party at first he refused to accept any overtures from the independents but subsequently he endeavoured to keep his foes divided by telling parliament that he preferred the army proposals and wished to consider them the army was now thoroughly divided and the influence of the extreme party was sufficient to raise a storm against cromwell who was spoken of as judas a mutiny occurred and was suppressed by the leaders but it was becoming clear that the agitators must be reckoned with they were already speaking of justice on the man of blood and charles began to fear for his safety in november sixteen forty seven he escaped to the isle of wight still putting his main trust in increasing the conflicts of his enemies his rejection however of the four bills in which he was asked to give security for parliament's independence and control over the militia at last induced the army and parliament to forget their differences and combine against him the vote for discontinuing further addresses to the king was passed in january sixteen forty eight it was now clear to cromwell that no hope remained of coming to terms with charles but how to arrange any future agreement between army fanatics moderate republicans and independents was not so clear for charles one card remained to play the scots had not ceased to ply him with promises and he now signed an agreement known as the engagement by which the scots pledged themselves to restore him to power in return for concessions to presbyterianism in england this last proof of duplicity led to the second civil war which broke out at once the english rising came first the scattered survivors of the royalist party took arms on all sides but they were badly organized and there was little difficulty in repressing them cromwell had a campaign in south wales and fairfax crushed risings at maidstone and colchester the prince of wales to whom a portion of the fleet had turned threatened the capital but was compelled to retire for lack of provisions somewhat strangely no enthusiasm was called forth in london and the city shut its gates on the royalist forces the scots gave more trouble their kingdom was divided into two parties the extreme presbyterians under argyle would have no hand in the rising unless charles took the covenant and forswore bishops and prayer book the more moderate party with whom the majority of the nobility sided were opposed to all extreme clericalism and were willing to fight on charles's moderate promises unfortunately their leader was the incapable hamilton though only partially supported he advanced into england in july there he was soon to meet cromwell who had done his work in wales and was ready to oppose the northern host the scottish forces were surprised before they could join the english royalists in north wales their english contingent was caught and conquered at preston august seventeenth sixteen forty eight the scottish army decamped toward the south and cromwell followed in pursuit through wigan taking ten thousand prisoners some of whom were sent home while others were sent as slaves to the west indies hamilton capitulated and the campaign was over when the war was finished there was a marked change the party of moderate presbyterianism in london had again the upper hand and was able to send terms to charles at newport but the king only replied by offering a very trifling part of what was asked in the army however there was a much stronger feeling that negotiation must cease and justice begin he who had caused the second war must be punished now that it was safely ended cromwell had written from preston about destroying those who trouble the land after sending an ultimatum to the king at newport on november sixteenth the army council asked for parliament's concurrence in their remonstrance in which the establishment of democracy and the trial of the king were urged this was neglected by the parliament and the army was exasperated into declaring that parliament had broken its trust 
and it was the duty of the army to put a stop to such proceedings pride's purge the ejection of the obstinate members by colonel pride on december sixth left parliament a tool in the hands of the army charles had already been seized by command of the officers and conveyed to hurst castle on the hampshire coast there was now no further question about bringing him to london for trial the commons passed an ordinance for trying the king on january first sixteen forty nine and when the lords refused it the lower house further declared that as the people are the real source of power the house of commons might make laws alone a high court of justice was then nominated but less than half of those originally nominated to it sat to try the king in westminster hall legally there was no justification for such a course as no process can issue against the sovereign the justification must be sought in moral and political grounds for us it is enough to note that the prisoner was charged with carrying on a wicked and tyrannical power according to his own will instead of that limited authority with which he was entrusted by the nation and laws thus was raised in its greatest and most terrible form the question of sovereignty which had already caused so much bloodshed but thus it found no satisfactory answer the king's reply completely convincing according to the old constitution and the letter of the law was a restatement of his superiority to law and a criticism of the illegality and partisan character of the court he was condemned and beheaded at whitehall on january thirtieth sixteen forty nine meeting his fate with a dignity and resignation which moved the hearts even of his enemies in the compassion which was felt for his bloody end it was forgotten by most men that he had brought his fate on himself by his persistent machinations against his captors and his reckless stirring up of the second civil war if he had kept quiet in his captivity he would never have come to the scaffold End of chapter five chapter six of king and parliament by george henry wakeling this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the commonwealth sixteen forty nine to sixteen sixty during the next ten years england was practically without a constitution one strong man with a military force behind him gained the power and kept order amid ever-increasing difficulties cromwell aimed at a settlement which should establish peace toleration order and commerce but he failed to secure them more than temporarily even by the sword the reason is not far to seek as england then was the task was impossible it was a political chaos the nation was split into two hostile camps and these again into many sections and shades of religious and political opinion a constable to keep the peace till the groundworks of law and order should be relayed was required cromwell achieved this and no more in spite of brilliant foreign policy and firm suppression of disorder he never gained the heart of the nation he would succumb to no party and no party was willing to sink its own opinions in order to secure the benefits which he was able to confer upon the country he found and brought no unity the army and the rump as the sixty independent members who formed the remnant of the purged parliament were named were now supreme but this supremacy was not likely to produce a peaceful settlement the army leaders were not unwilling to work with the mutilated assembly but the agitators and their program had still to be reckoned with a scheme brought before parliament on january twentieth entitled the agreement of the people explained their views in favour of a complete democracy frequent parliaments truly representing the people should carry out the national will but the program of these extremists was not adopted after kingship and the house of lords had been abolished a council of state was appointed in february with authority from parliament to carry on the entire government of the country 
there was much talk of the responsibility of this council to parliament and of the future free and equal distributed representation of the people but in talk it stopped the discontent which the levellers thereon manifested was pitilessly crushed by cromwell and a rising of the more hot-headed spirits led to no result but the discredit of their cause there was thus a provisional government with everything to settle but for the present the republic had to make good its position against a threefold opposition in ireland there had existed for eight years a formidable rebellion if partly religious for the catholics of english blood were not given any toleration it was still more national the irish romanists were demanding as always supremacy and separation from england hence came the failure of the loyal and high-hearted ormond to combine the elements of the rising into a royalist movement in the autumn of sixteen forty nine cromwell came over and sacked the towns of drogheda and wexford massacring their garrisons with pitiless severity his allegation was that slaughter after due warning would end opposition and so be merciful the struggle speedily showed its true character to be one of race the english catholics deserted ormond and royalism was crushed the subjugation of ireland went on under ireton english colonists were introduced and the natives driven behind the line of the shannon cromwell was next called to scotland where more work awaited him after hamilton's defeat the extreme presbyterian party was in power but they had no wish to see england a republic with independency triumphant nor had they any sympathy with the execution of the king they still hoped to obtain from the prince of wales the concessions which they had failed to wring from his father at newcastle charles the second had been proclaimed in edinburgh on his father's execution but did not go to scotland until after the failure of the irish rising he swallowed the covenant graciously enough and the scottish rising became a fact in a skilful campaign which ended with the decisive victory of dunbar september third sixteen fifty cromwell stifled once more the hopes of presbyterian royalism but while he was further settling the country a strong wave of royalism rose behind him hamilton and montrose had been executed as traitors to their country and the covenant but an army of their adherents marched into england with charles at their head in august of sixteen fifty one cromwell rapidly followed and at worcester his crowning mercy routed this force on september third prince charles escaped to france after a thousand adventures and the opposition in england was crushed only at sea did the royalist under prince rupert succeed in giving the navy of the young republic considerable work for royalist piracy with centres in Scilly and the channel islands continued to menace the trade of the country for some time thus with a threefold victory at home the new government opened its career it was not long before foreign affairs called for action jealousy of dutch commercial enterprise led to the passing of the navigation act in sixteen fifty one this aimed at securing for english ships and english capital the lucrative carrying trade by which the dutch made large profits out of england's commerce henceforth no ship was to land goods in english ports unless she were english made and manned or belonged to the country whose products she was bringing over this was to apply the economic doctrine of protection to the creation of a merchant navy the dutch were naturally angry and a collision occurred between the english admiral blake and the celebrated von tromp which led to a declaration of war in july sixteen fifty two the english navy was ably organized and there was frequent and victorious fighting in the channel but in spite of this successful outset the new government was experiencing grave troubles at home the party of progress and reform in the army though balked of its dearest aims did not cease to advocate changes and the old feud between army and parliament was always threatening to break out cromwell and his council of officers were willing to see some reforms carried out 
while the rump did not hesitate to claim the full sovereignty of the unmutilated parliament it was not to be expected that such antagonistic principles would long work in harmony when in november sixteen fifty one the rump consented to dissolve itself but not till three years should have passed the army grew wondrous impatient the introduction in the spring of sixteen fifty three of a bill for making the rump a perpetual parliament with a veto on future elections brought matters to a crisis the officers were necessitated though with much reluctancy to put an end to this parliament every one knows how cromwell entered the house at the head of his musketeers forcibly evicted the recalcitrant members and bade his myrmidons remove that bauble the speaker's mace the army though as usual disclaiming any desire to interfere with civil affairs had once more interfered this was considered by the council of state a menace to all government and its members forthwith dissolved their body the lord general and his officers now stood alone and england was without a government the appointment of a fresh council of state in which the officers and their chief placed a large majority of their own body was only a temporary expedient to cromwell it seemed that england could be kept in order by the sword aided by a few local and central officials who would continue to act as if parliament were sitting but there were many opponents watching cromwell the saints as the extreme independents were called were claiming to rule the earth the true republicans who thought saints should be modest and wait till the kingdom was given them were anxious for a settled free government by and for the people government by consent as they called it to neither of these views could cromwell subscribe his answer was complete where he asked shall we find the consent amongst the prelatical presbyterian independent anabaptist or levelling parties this is the key to his position a free parliament he would not allow for a free parliament meant royalty and the nation finally refused to take anything less for the moment however he thought it wise to allow the saints to try their hand a body of nominees mainly chosen by the independent ministers was summoned to the number of one hundred and forty four to them cromwell committed the affairs of the kingdom they began to reform and abolish with vigour and finally in their zeal threatened to upset the institution of private property by attacking tithes and patronage their assembly which is known as barebones parliament because one of its prominent members bore that extraordinary name resigned its power in december sixteen fifty three the army leaders under lambert now proposed to make cromwell lord protector with a council and a parliament in due form the proposal was drawn up in the instrument of government it was a new kind of constitution for all the powers of protector and parliament were carefully defined and separated no alteration in their respective powers being allowed the liberty of the commons was preserved by its being made impossible for the protector to dissolve them till they should have sat five months here then was the barrier against party violence and to this barrier cromwell looked to save the kingdom with a settled form of government all might go well and in foreign affairs the outlook was promising the dutch had been beaten and brought to terms and now bowed before english commercial supremacy cromwell had allied himself closely with sweden in order to keep open the baltic trade against the monopolizing spirit of danes and dutch and it was this alliance which had brought the latter to terms the test of the new government would be a parliament and this met in september of sixteen fifty four scotland and ireland were for the first time represented at westminster and a rational rearrangement of the constituencies foreshadowing in many points the famous reform bill of eighteen thirty two had been carried out but cromwell's plan met with little respect his opponents in the new parliament discussed the very foundation of the whole government in the hands of a single person and parliament the protector thereupon declared that they were not to criticize any fundamental part of the new system 
and turned out of parliament those who persisted in doing so yet the remainder proved so obstinate that a dissolution occurred after the legal five months stipulated in the instrument the unpopularity in which this coup d'etat involved the protector caused the royalists to attempt a rising in wiltshire under penruddock it was easily suppressed but the need of strengthening the royal authority in the country districts led to a new device england was divided into eleven provinces over which as many officers were placed these major generals were to organize the local militia and to use it for police purposes this temporarily abrogated the system of local government established by the tudors the institutions of the country were in abeyance taxes were imposed illegally and men were arbitrarily imprisoned republicans and independents complained of these pashas and their high-handed doings yet much was done which made in the protector's favour men nominated to livings were carefully supervised by a board of triers jews were allowed to return to england for the first time since twelve ninety the legal system was reformed and simplified yet discontent increased when a new parliament assembled in september sixteen fifty six foreign politics were for the moment in the ascendant the two great powers of france and spain were now face to face on the conclusion of the thirty years war each was anxious for the alliance of england cromwell chose france this secured the expulsion of prince charles from french soil and was more likely to satisfy growing protestantism than any dealings with spain philip the fourth was the champion of catholicism and moreover claimed a complete monopoly of the west indian trade english enterprise found vent in a successful attack on the rich isle of jamaica and war was declared against spain in february sixteen fifty six it was not long before france actively joined in the war and cromwell was able to secure from her the restoration of the protestants of the waldensian valleys whom the duke of savoy had been persecuting dunkirk was taken for england before the protector's death the new parliament had been carefully packed the instrument had given the protector's council the power to reject members who were considered disabled to be elected nearly one hundred republicans and presbyterians having been thus excluded the remainder proceeded to offer cromwell the title of king under a new documentary constitution this humble petition and advice gave more freedom and power to parliament though it still remained powerless to touch any of the fundamentals a house of peers was also to be created cromwell after much debate refused to take the kingship but accepted the rest of the new constitution when parliament met again in january sixteen fifty eight the members before excluded were allowed to take their seats as no power of scrutiny had been put in the hands of the government by the petition and advice their objection to the new constitution and to the other house as they called cromwell's peers made it impossible for the protector to keep them in session without altering his views he expected his parliament to be loyal to a constitution which many of them had had no hand in framing as this was impossible he dissolved them it was useless for him to beg for unity in the face of the dangers which from time to time threatened the republic they would not listen thus he who for years had kept england safe prosperous and respected had settled nothing his death which occurred in september sixteen fifty eight left the problem of government to be faced by men infinitely less able than himself the late lord protector's rule had satisfied no party though it had curbed all and now the strife was going to break out again his son richard who succeeded by virtue of the provisions of the petition and advice was both by taste and education a mere country gentleman he had neither the power nor the wish to take up the task which lay before him and his speedy fall made way for absolute anarchy cromwell had foreseen this but when he had named the many parties whose existence made free government impossible he had omitted to speak of one the party which would restore the king in order to secure order and peace 
on richard's accession the military officers under lambert fleetwood and others at once began to demand for the army a leader independent of the civil government oliver had been both general and protector but richard hardly knew a pike from a musket to resist this movement the new protector summoned a parliament in which he had a majority against the wallingford house party as the officers were named his protectorate was recognized and the army finding that they were outvoted in parliament demanded a dissolution richard fearing an outbreak of civil war took the only sensible course and abdicated on the twenty second of april sixteen fifty nine the party of lambert with whom the republican foes of the protectorate were allied was now supreme but it contained a strong leaven of levellers and other extremists a fresh element of discord was added when its leaders resolved to restore the rump parliament which had been driven from westminster by oliver the tottering fabric of the republic now consisted of this caricature of a parliament it consisted of only forty members a few self-seeking soldier leaders and an army which was daily becoming more unpopular owing to its connection with the levelling programmes the wildest discord was rife between the civil and military elements parliament claimed supremacy while the army fresh from lambert's victory over some royalists in cheshire did not care to conceal its claim to complete independence finally in october sixteen fifty nine relying on the adherence of monk who was commanding in scotland the rump took the daring step of depriving of their commissions lambert and those of his friends who had encouraged petitions in favour of the independence of the army the irate officers replied by driving the rump a second time from westminster george monk from his post beyond the tweed was grimly watching the dance at westminster nominally a presbyterian certainly loathing the whole race of sectaries and levellers he saw in lambert's triumph nothing but danger for the future when it was announced that he was preparing to march into england the very rumour of his opposition sufficed to overthrow the military government in london and while lambert marched northward to confront monk the rump returned uninvited to westminster the fleet held to the civil power the sailors petitioned for a free and full parliament and such leaders of the army as could be safely touched were banished monk started from scotland on new year's day sixteen sixty in london where he was at once completely master of affairs he restored the presbyterian members expelled by colonel pride twelve years before and declared for a free parliament the royalist presbyterian members were now in a majority writs were issued for a free convention and the long parliament at last consented of its own free will to dissolve itself march sixteen sixty the new convention parliament contained a large majority for the moderates on all sides was heard the cry for the restoration of the old order charles was in holland and issued from breda at monk's suggestion his famous declaration it promised amnesty toleration and a general settlement of the kingdom in accordance with the decisions of parliament this was considered sufficient the more prudent presbyterians wished for some clearer understanding with the prince but the nation would not wait the reaction was in full flow the first act of the convention was to invite charles to return and to resolve that government in england was vested in king lords and commons the Naseby, rechristened for the occasion the royal charles brought the king to dover and he reached the capital on may twenty ninth amid universal rejoicings End of chapter six chapter seven of king in parliament by george henry wakeling this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami charles the second sixteen sixty to sixteen eighty five charles the eldest son of the late monarch was thus accepted as king not so much because he had a right to the position as because the nation could not get on without him 
the experience of the last few years was felt to be worse than anything that had gone before men of all conditions now rallied to the side of the crown because it was likely to be the champion of a known order of government cavaliers and republicans presbyterians and churchmen made a temporary alliance in the interests of the old constitution the rebellion had settled hardly anything the problem of sovereignty was still without a solution there should not be a sovereign army or a sovereign presbytery in that and that only men were agreed the question of toleration was not answered the country was just as much split up into parties as before but the nation as a whole was nervous about order and forgot to be anxious about liberty one thing alone was tolerably certain as a result of the long struggle no future king could hope to set himself for any long period against the will of the entire people if charles wished to have his own way it must also be the way of the nation or of a clear majority of the nation ship money or forced loans were not likely to recur if this was the net result of the war it would soon become clear that the king had a fair chance to rule as he pleased provided he could play off the numerous parties against each other and keep the fear of civil war well before the eyes of moderate men now this is exactly what charles did he was a cool-headed selfish man with admirable manners and no convictions to trouble him he was not likely to make a crusade to save bishops or to save anything but he liked his own way not because he felt he had a duty to do but because he found it pleasant to be independent yet on one point he shared his father's and grandfather's ideas he believed in the mission of the stuart family and would put up even with personal inconvenience rather than repudiate the divine hereditary right fortunately for him he possessed along with this view the inestimable gift of tact in which his family was generally so conspicuously wanting he knew as well as anybody that he could not withstand the whole nation as he himself put it he did not wish to go on his travels again hence the whole reign became a struggle in which the king however much he might offend one party was never without a party to side with him the reason of this is to be looked for in the old religious parties which now take three forms churchmen protestant dissenters of all sorts and roman catholics here are sufficient sources of discord on a vital question a fourth element was soon added the king of france charles was not proud and if his parliament or his opposition proved troublesome he would apply for money and advice to louis the fourteenth that prince generally found it worth his while to supply both there are five well-marked periods into which the twenty-five years of this reign may be divided the first lasted only a year and witnessed the attempt of the convention parliament to settle the outstanding questions of religion and politics on a moderate basis its place was taken by the cavalier parliament which set to work to strengthen the revived monarchy re-establish the anglican church and persecute all other creeds this was during the full tide of reaction against the ideals of puritanism the second period sixteen sixty two to sixteen seventy two finds this parliament gradually losing confidence in the king whose schemes of toleration it hated and whose minister it impeached the king and his secret counsellors now trafficked with louis and there gradually appeared a fair possibility of a complete reaction against the restored monarchy two parties were forming one that of parliament whose religious policy had been outraged another the popular party which hated the foreign intrigues and the persecuting statutes to which the king had assented the third period sixteen seventy two to sixteen seventy nine was one in which this twofold opposition failed to combine against the crown and charles was able to play off his opponents one against the other in the fourth period sixteen seventy nine to sixteen eighty one a great opposition 
the beginning of the future Whig party was organized, and the attempt was made to oust the Duke of York, an avowed papist, from the succession to the crown. This question divided the nation, and the popular party, in the hands of immoderate men, wrecked its own cause. The last period, 1681 to 1685, found the king secure and triumphant, free from Parliament and from his other enemies, who had roused the fears of the nation and hurried all those who cared more for order than for liberty into the royal camp. The convention, which had no strict claim to the name of Parliament, since it was not summoned by royal writ, had a tremendous problem to deal with. After such a time of religious and political discord, it was no easy task to set things in order. Some revenge upon the regicides was to be expected, and thirteen of the most prominent were put to death. A bill of indemnity covering the whole period from 1637 to 1660 secured other men from punishment. The House of Lords was restored, and the bishops regained their seats. The army was disbanded, the royal income fixed at £1,200,000 per annum, and the crown lands restored. But the cavaliers who had been obliged to sell their lands were not reinstated if they had in any way recognized the usurping government. The religious question was far more difficult. The king had been both a covenanter and a Roman Catholic in his time, and it now suited him to pose as an Anglican. The convention represented that combination of churchmen and Presbyterians which had brought back the king. They restored the clergy who had been ejected from livings by the Puritans, but did not disturb men who had been rightly inducted by the patrons, and thus left many Presbyterians and independents in possession of livings. The only arrangement which could make this system work well would have been a scheme of comprehension, which is the term used for the adaptation of the church to suit the views of the more moderate dissenters. The king wished to carry this out, but as he included toleration for independents and Roman Catholics, it was not likely that the churchmen and Presbyterians would agree to it. In December 1660, this famous assembly was dissolved, and an intensely strong Anglican and Cavalier spirit animated the new Parliament. It condemned the claims of the Long Parliament to regulate the militia, and declared that force to be entirely in the hands of the Crown. The religious reaction was complete, and after the failure of a conference at the Savoy Palace in which churchmen and Presbyterians made an ineffectual attempt to bridge over their differences, the true character of the change was shown. Parliament passed the Corporation Act, 1661, by which all members of town corporations were compelled to renounce the covenant, repudiate the right of people to resist the crown, and receive the sacrament as churchmen. The king was obliged to accept this policy as he was in need of money, and Parliament cared more for their church than even for their king. In May 1662, the Presbyterians who still held livings were confronted by the Act of Uniformity, which compelled all beneficed clergy to accept the prayer book, and 2,000 ministers quitted their posts rather than submit. It was not unnatural that churchmen should think it necessary that men who held benefices should be ordained by bishops and believe in the legal church. But they had shown a persecuting spirit in forcing town officers to believe as they did, and were soon to cruelly persecute those who had been removed from office in the church. The cavaliers had now struck a blow at their enemies in town and parish, and carried the king with them. They shortly afterwards took vengeance on Sir Harry Vane, the hero of the scene in the House of Commons, when Strafford's famous words in the council were produced. He, with Lambert, was tried for treason on the ground that Charles II was illegally king during the period of Cromwell's government. Vane was executed on this flimsy argument. The next period raises the question how far Charles could be dragged along by this party. The chief minister was now the Earl of Clarendon, who, as Sir Edward Hyde, had been one of Charles I's most trusted advisers. 
he was strongly opposed to toleration and wished the church to keep her supremacy indeed the persecution statutes of this period have been named the clarendon code charles did not like the domination of clarendon any better than the supremacy of parliament but for a time all went well the king was married in 1662 to a portuguese princess catherine of braganza this alliance naturally brought the english government into line with france for louis was supporting portugal in the maintenance of her independence against spain the sale of dunkirk to the french king bound this friendship closer and pleased charles who saw in the purchase money a means of independence but there was no harmony for the king was already talking of using his inherent power of dispensing with laws footnote dispensing power means the ancient royal right to pardon the breach of an act suspending power is a claim to declare the act or acts to be no longer in force End footnote. in order to lighten the burdens upon roman catholics and protestant dissenters parliament and the chancellor clarendon agreed in resisting this royal attempt to undermine their policy a war with holland temporarily united king and parliament the dutch were still our commercial rivals on the sea and our colonial opponents in the indies in the days of king james english puritan colonists had sailed to the shores of north america and the descendants of these famous pilgrim fathers had now established a great group of colonies east of the hudson river this settlement was known as new england lower down the coast virginia the oldest of the english settlements abroad had grown into a prosperous slave-owning country between these two settlements was a district colonized by the dutch and hence constant quarrels arose charles was also angry with holland on his own account his sister mary had married the prince of orange who died young on his decease the dutch refused to continue his son william the third in his father's office of stadtholder a great statesman named de witt now guided dutch politics under the title of grand pensionary and the young william of orange charles's nephew the future king of england was kept out of the chief magistracy which his ancestors had held for three generations the war broke out in sixteen sixty five and was hotly waged at sea the king of france for the moment joined the dutch against england his policy was a deep and clever one the real object which he had in view was the extension of france to the rhine and the gradual absorption of the decaying spanish empire for these two objects he strove until his death all the lands between the french border and the rhine the spanish netherlands belgium luxembourg lorraine the county of burgundy and alsace were meant to be attacked in turn louis's wife was the sister of king charles the second of spain a sickly boy who it was hoped would soon die his vast inheritance might then fall to the french king in spite of his renunciation in the treaty of the pyrenees of all future rights which should accrue through his wife all this was plainly opposed to dutch interests for the dutch were bound to resent the approach of so powerful a monarch to their frontiers but louis was for the present pledged by treaty to assist them and did not wish to show his hand when louis declared war in sixteen sixty six the english government was extending its policy of persecution being alarmed lest the dissenters should side with the dutch thus the cruel conventicle act imposed in sixteen sixty four severe penalties against those who should worship in any way other than that prescribed by the act of uniformity and in sixteen sixty five the dissenting ministers were further forbidden by the five mile act to approach within five miles of any corporate town and so debarred from earning a livelihood by teaching the great plague was raging in london and a few months later the great fire destroyed a large part of the city thus england was prepared by her disunion and disaster rather for peace than for war the dutch also became alive to the dangers with which they were threatened by louis schemes thus negotiations were opened between the two principles in order to hasten the two principles into peace 
de witt sent his vessels into the thames and medway and the roar of foreign guns was heard for the first and last time by the citizens of london in the end england secured the dutch colonies between new england and virginia while the dutch kept their hold on the spice islands of the east indies for some time discontent had been growing both in and out of parliament and there were grave scandals as to the management of public money voted for the war there were rumours that the king had a design to ally himself with france and to govern without a parliament by means of an armed force small as the standing army was since all but a few regiments had been disbanded in sixteen sixty it was not unnaturally considered a menace to freedom the sale of dunkirk was thought almost as great a national disgrace as the burning of english shipping by the dutch in the medway all ills were ascribed to the minister charles was not inclined to exert himself to save his father's old friend for clarendon did not share his views as to toleration or scruple to show contempt for the king's immoral life he was impeached and banished the next administration is known in history as the cabal because the names of the men who were chiefly consulted by the king during the next few years were found to spell cabal by their initial letters they were clifford and arlington who were roman catholics buckingham the son of james i's favourite anthony ashley afterwards earl of shaftesbury and lauderdale who was governing scotland in the episcopal interest and persecuting the covenanters who after the execution of their leader argyle at the restoration continued to be an oppressed and discredited party until the end of the century these five men were widely different in their ideas and had but one common object a broader view in church matters than was prevalent in parliament louis was alarming the dutch by his successes in the spanish netherlands which he was now claiming by right of his wife englishmen were hostile to the advance of the great catholic monarch and an alliance was made by england holland and sweden to force him to desist he gave way for the time and restored the county of burgundy though he kept several recently acquired fortresses in the netherlands but charles had never cared for the popular policy of the triple alliance and soon entered into a secret negotiation with the french king louis was anxious to crush the dutch who were bound to be the opponents of his grasping frontier policy and was most anxious to bind charles and the english to neutrality if not to cooperation parliament was opposed to louis and therefore charles could not join him unless he obtained money for doing so since such an alliance was bound to alienate his subjects here at last was a chance to get free from the leading strings in which the cavalier parliament had kept him and the king seized it by the secret treaty of dover known only to clifford and arlington charles agreed to help louis against the dutch and to declare himself a roman catholic for a round sum of two hundred thousand pounds a year this treaty was nearly as ridiculous as it was disgraceful that the english would ever allow themselves to be led back to popery by their king ought by this time to have been clear even to a Stuart. the real policy of the cabal was shown when in sixteen seventy two the king issued his famous declaration of indulgence the parliament which had already shown itself more zealous for the church than for the crown was not sitting at the moment and the king's supposed power to suspend ecclesiastical laws was used to grant freedom from the stringent penal laws to both nonconformists and roman catholics the leader of this policy was ashley who had just been made earl of shaftesbury and lord chancellor when parliament met in sixteen seventy three after a long prorogation the declaration of indulgence was before their eyes though the treaty with louis was still a secret war had just been declared against holland and men who knew nothing of the secret plot were not sorry to punish holland for her attack on english ships in sixteen sixty seven the third period of the reign opens with this session in which the king soon found himself opposed to two parties the cavaliers who resented the declaration and the moderate men who began to fear that the declaration was only part of the french alliance and tended to roman catholicism and arbitrary government rather than to the relief of protestant dissenters at first the parliament was eager for the war against the dutch 
shaftesbury the lord chancellor made his celebrated speech in which he announced the policy of the french alliance he knew nothing of the secret treaty in the words de lenda est cartago parliament voted large sums but showed no sign of bowing to the indulgence scheme it was not long before its views were more clearly expressed the king had to withdraw the declaration and the test act was passed it declared that all who held any office under the crown must renounce the doctrine of transubstantiation and receive the sacrament in the english church this was the final blow to the cabal meanwhile englishmen were becoming alarmed at the successes of louis perhaps some suspicions of the secret treaty were abroad the war with holland became unpopular the fear of roman catholicism increased when men reflected that we were at war with a protestant power in alliance with a catholic one many feared that charles would use his army to make himself independent for the commonwealth was not forgotten and shaftesbury the apostle of toleration was dismissed he very soon entered the ranks of the opposition but not of course to act in alliance with the bigoted churchmen who had passed the test act the various elements of this opposition were not likely to unite and so the king at present had little to fear shaftesbury had been willing to use the royal prerogative to gain toleration and could not therefore complain with parliament of the suspending power the cavaliers of the test act were not likely to join the originators of the indulgence but the opposition to france was too strong to be resisted and in sixteen seventy four charles cleverly yielded so much and made peace with holland thus the king had twice yielded his point in each case on the question of religion for his alliance with louis was really a catholic policy so disunited were his opponents however that he might have been absolute if he had desisted from all religious opposition to parliament there was in sixteen seventy five a return to the policy of clarendon when sir thomas osborne earl of danby a strong churchman and a friend of royalty became chief adviser of the crown but the popularity of this long parliament was now waning it had outstayed its welcome men were tired of its factious temper especially when danby produced a bill to impose on all placemen footnote persons holding office under the crown end footnote an oath that they would neither resist the crown nor attempt alteration of government in church or state this however he failed to convert into law the leaders of the toleration party were anxious for a dissolution as they hoped for a broader religious feeling in the next parliament that the nation was partly of the same opinion may be gathered from the fact that the government thought proper to order the closing of the coffee-houses in which men were in the habit of discussing politics there being no newspapers to read lastly the king of france who was now obliged to face a general european coalition against his schemes was most anxious to see the cavalier parliament dissolved their strong anti-french attitude might he thought force charles into a french war as it had already forced him into a dutch peace when after more than a year's prorogation parliament reassembled in february sixteen seventy seven louis's anticipations were realized and a cry for a french war arose the opposition lords with shaftesbury at their head maintained that a year's prorogation dissolved ipso facto a parliament since by the old laws there must be a meeting every year this was a mere quibble for the triennial act of sixteen forty one requiring a meeting at least once in three years was still in force though its more stringent provisions had been repealed but the action of these leaders serves to show that there was an opposition to both king and parliament in this situation the shrewd king once more proved his tact since parliament was averse to france he determined to side with them and desert his french alliance he would thus play off parliament against the toleration party which suspected his roman catholic designs the money which he could no longer obtain from louis he would be able to get from his subjects for his real aim being to strengthen his army in case of future need money was absolutely necessary 
thus the toleration party which could not like louis and parliament supply money was isolated a grand opportunity to persuade a rather incredulous parliament of his anti-french intentions now presented itself and the king was not slow to take it during the dutch war the grand pensionary had been murdered by a mob and the young prince of orange had been restored at the age of twenty-one to the stadtholdership this protestant prince the lifelong enemy of the great french king was now married with the approval of charles to his cousin mary eldest daughter of james duke of york the king's brother parliament was greatly pleased at this third marked success they voted a million and the astute king was able to add to his army he soon found however that he had only exchanged masters and as for louis his revenge was easy there was a growing fear in england that charles had meant to secure his own independence of parliament by an army and french help the french king cleverly stimulated this fear and took into his pay several of the unscrupulous leaders of the english opposition while assuring them that he had deserted the cause of their sovereign the toleration party forsaken by charles was taken up by louis this was indeed a sufficient complication and yet charles added another string to his bow by asking louis to pay him large sums to enable him to be independent of the cavalier parliament so intricate had the politics of england become that though king and parliament were apparently in alliance against france both were asking money from that power to do its behests such a situation could not last the french king took the opportunity to make peace with holland at nemehen august sixteen seventy eight and obtained his coveted county of burgundy together with many fortresses in the netherlands parliament was becoming more and more nervous as to the intentions of charles the opposition was becoming stronger and clearer though there was as yet no great questions on which they could unite at this moment the king's luck deserted him there arose a cry on which the opposition could appeal to a sensitive nation the popish plot a tissue of falsehoods weaved around a slender thread of fact was announced by a depraved villain named titus oates he and others like him declared that there was a deep-rooted plot by which roman catholics were endeavouring to subvert the freedom of the country assassinate the king and restore england to the papal allegiance the nation was alarmed the old fears of the french alliance and the indulgence had made the way easy for such a panic parliament caught the alarm papists were hurried to execution on the slenderest evidence and the opposition leaders some of whom believed genuinely in the story fanned the flames an act to disable papists from sitting in either house of parliament was passed as if to show where the real popish plot had been the secret of a letter written by danby at the king's bidding in which the english ambassador was instructed to ask louis for money was now made public by danby's enemies the old treaty of dover was as yet only suspected the minister was at once impeached charles avowed his own orders and to screen his too faithful servant dissolved the cavalier parliament louis had for the moment the game in his hands and the opposition had gained a case to lay before the country in the fourth period of the reign this case took a definite shape and led dangerously near to rebellion james the king's brother was heir to the throne for charles had no legitimate children he was a declared roman catholic and had recently married as his second wife the princess mary of modena who was of the same faith his first wife was anne hyde daughter of the chancellor clarendon and mother of james's daughters mary and anne who were afterwards queens of england with the popish plot filling men's mouths an army still on foot in spite of parliamentary demands for its disbandment and louis the fourteenth still successfully creeping up to the rhine frontier it was not difficult for the opposition to raise a cry that the protestant constitution was in danger they struck straight at the one idea which charles cherished more than his ease or his independence the hereditary right of his family and demanded security against a popish successor 
lord william russell led in the commons while shaftesbury represented the opposition in the lords charles tried to divert attention from james by adopting a protestant foreign policy but when danby pleaded the royal pardon to bar his impeachment another strong case was added to the score of the popular party for parliament declared such a pardon to be illegal at last there was a point which the king would not yield and could not by shuffling the cards evade at this critical moment sir william temple brought forward his celebrated scheme intended to solve the ever-recurring conflicts between parliament and the crown he proposed that the privy council should be reconstructed and made a sort of mediator between king and parliament it was to consist of thirty members fifteen royal nominees and fifteen members of the legislature they were to advise the crown and no step was to be taken without them charles adopted this cumbrous plan many of his bitterest opponents were made members shaftesbury becoming president the king now hoped to stave off the succession difficulty and offered extraordinary securities for protestantism provided the duke of york was allowed to succeed in due course all holders of places of trust together with the military and naval administration were to be approved by parliament which was to be secured from a dissolution at the time of the king's death but the leaders of the opposition were not to be silenced they rightly concluded that such safeguards were illusory for no parliament can bind its successors and in may of sixteen seventy nine the exclusion bill to prevent the succession of james was produced the king meant to go to all lengths to prevent this and therefore after passing the celebrated habeas corpus act which secured that the ancient writ to inquire into the cause of imprisonment should not be evaded by legal officers his third parliament was dissolved the council scheme had completely failed the idea of exclusion involved some plan for a successor other than james and it is here that shaftesbury and his party made their greatest mistake they openly proposed to seat the duke of monmouth one of the many natural sons of the king upon the throne of england monmouth was popular and had gained some military reputation having just won a victory over the extreme covenanters in scotland at bothwell brig and suppressed a very dangerous rising there was not wanting agitators who spread a tale of charles's marriage with lucy walters the young duke's mother this the king emphatically denied and the persistence of the shaftesbury faction in this plan brought about a split even in the ranks of the opposition lord halifax a brilliant and adventurous politician threw in his lot with the government he is generally known as the trimmer for he loved to desert the winning side and thus gratify his vanity by rectifying the balance russell and others still adhered to shaftesbury once more a parliament was elected in october sixteen seventy nine but charles refused to summon it and for a year the members were never assembled it is during this time that the names whig and tory were first given to the two parties those who believed in the popish plot and wished to change the succession were derisively compared to the whigamores or whigs a bitter sect of scottish covenanters those who adhered to the court and divine right were styled tories a name by which the outlawed banditti of ireland were known the whigs petitioned for a summons of parliament while the tories arranged counter petitions abhorring the idea of altering the succession thus the terms petitioners and abhorrers were also used to describe the two factions beneath the question of the succession lay the great dispute which had commenced in the days of the long parliament as to whether the nation was to have a personal king or an official one for it was practically the same thing to discuss whether a nation may choose a king or must accept a distasteful one because of his pedigree the stuart theory of divine right trembled in the balance as that of the discretionary power of monarchs had in the days of charles i and laud the two great parties had a different view of the question of sovereignty as they had of the question of toleration in october sixteen eighty the parliament at last met charles tried once more to shelve the question by asking for unity in the face of the french king's advances toward the dutch frontier 
but men saw through this and knew that he probably had another letter about french gold ready for his ministers besides louis had been careful to keep up the quarrel for he knew england was a dangerous factor in european politics if it was united he worked up the fears of arbitrary government and the exclusion bill was passed in the commons in the lords however halifax made a brilliant speech cutting deeply into the whig programme the two protestant daughters of james mary princess of orange and anne were excluded by shaftesbury's scheme and the lords taught by halifax refused to adopt it but the opposition could not now retreat already there was a talk in parliament of toleration and comprehension and the city of london was pledged to the exclusion bill charles once more dissolved parliament and summoned a new one to oxford in order to be out of the way of shaftesbury's brisk boys as the mobs he hoped to raise were styled in march sixteen eighty one this assembly met in christ church hall the whig leaders fearing lest they might be molested in that home of royalism came with armed followers an unconstitutional blunder to which they largely owed their ruin the question speedily came to an issue charles offered everything even to make the prince of orange regent during his brother's lifetime provided the title of king were reserved to the latter who might be banished from the kingdom this was clever for it forced shaftesbury to rely on the duke of monmouth as his candidate charles refused point-blank to recognize his natural son as heir to the throne he had split the opposition by this manoeuvre and knew that he had louis's golden reserve for the latter would not care to see a new government under monmouth and shaftesbury pledged to a protestant policy louis only wanted charles to quarrel with his parliament and would pay either or both so long as they were not on speaking terms the last parliament of king charles was at once dissolved after one week's stormy session the last period of the reign witnesses a great tory reaction there was no parliament william of orange came to ask his uncle's help against the french who were overrunning alsace but obtained no assistance the cavaliers who feared their church policy would collapse if shaftesbury and his party obtained power now rallied to the king to prevent the dissenters from getting a footing in politics they were willing to keep to hereditary succession just as their ancestors had rallied to charles rather than trust the church to pym and the puritans the entire moderate party was more alarmed at the menacing attitude of the whigs than at the royal army which charles maintained or at the seizure of strasburg by louis the fourteenth civil war was an evil they never meant to face again thus there was for the first time in the reign no need for the king to give way he had not to choose between abandoning his brother and starting on his travels for the majority of the nation sensitive as they were about popery chose for him james they considered a less evil than civil war thus the conditions enabled the king to change his tactics instead of defending hereditary right which men were now eager to do for him he was able to attack its assailants shaftesbury was accused of treason the london grand jury to the delight of the whigs threw out the bill but the men who now advised charles sunderland lawrence hyde and halifax were determined to crush their opponents london which by adhering to parliament had ruined charles i and had so recently proved itself a stronghold of the whigs saw its gates thrown down and its privileges attacked on various trifling pretexts the ancient charter of the capital city was confiscated and was only renewed upon conditions which ensured a subservient corporation a similar fate was meted out to other towns and the great centres of dissent and whiggery were thus rendered harmless meanwhile shaftesbury's ill-advised design to appeal to arms on the question of the succession completed the ruin of the already discredited whigs russell monmouth and others were averse to such an extreme course and shaftesbury no longer able to rely on the adherents of london fled to holland where he died in sixteen eighty three but his fiery spirit which had already ruined the movement lived on in a more desperate body of men an attempt was made by some extreme members of the rank and file of the whigs to settle the whole question 
by a plot to assassinate charles and his brother the plan happily an abortive one was to waylay the victims at the rye house on their way from newmarket this naturally caused all who had been connected with the recent agitation to be suspected russell and algernon sidney were tried and executed though there was no evidence to connect them with the murderous plan but the laws of treason were severely administered and the known opinions of these men evidenced in sidney's case by some unpublished writings declaring the right to resist a bad king were sufficient to bar all hope of acquittal monmouth was banished and the great agitation which had threatened to sweep away the Stuart theory of divine right was at an end in the moment of triumph when four years had elapsed without a parliament with the opposition discredited and crushed the skilful victor died the roman catholics for whom he had risked so much and achieved so little had the satisfaction of receiving charles into their communion on his deathbed as he was calm and collected amid the crises and agitations of his political life so his perfect manners quiet humour and unflinching courage in the midst of great pain lasted to the end after apologizing to those who stood around for the unconscionable time which he took in dying charles expired on february sixth sixteen eighty five end of chapter seven